So we're going to talk about uh, eating disorders, uh, particularly focusing on the on the um, on the workplace. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Andres Fonseca. I'm a consultant psychiatrist, and I'm one of the founders at, uh, at Thrive. And I'm very pleased to host uh, Zoe. Um, Zoe who is from First Steps. So do you want to say a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Zoe Burnett. It's lovely to be here today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I work at First Steps Eating Disorder Service. We are a Midlands-based charity, but we're spreading quite quickly, so watch this space. But our job is to support all people struggling with an eating disorder, providing early intervention, providing support groups, one-to-one -one support, counselling, psychotherapy, all sorts. Um, I'm also in charge of the school workshops again, just to get in that early intervention and ensuring ensuring everyone's needs are being met. Um, so, um, so it's, it's got it's got a school side, and it's got a. Um, so, what ages do you do you cover with first steps? Yeah, all ages, all, all ages, ages, all genders, all everyone um, so you yeah. know even children young children are probably for the service yeah so i think the youngest personally i've worked with is five year old okay. um so and the oldest person in the service currently is 82 because i had a look on the database today so we cover a, a big age a big age range fantastic so and um i mean we'll talk about how to um you know contact the and and, and how to approach the 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 charity but uh in a nutshell what what are the ways in which people get in touch with you normally to be honest the easiest and best way is just for our website have a little look at the website have a little look at some of the things we offer if it's of interest there's a big, big orange button on the bottom of our website that says make a referral here you can't really miss it and just pop in a referral and that will come directly to us and we aim to get back to you within 10 days and if you're worried um, about somebody, can you can you make a referral on behalf of somebody else that you're worried about? Absolutely, yes. So we accept, yeah, we get a lot of self-referrals, but we also get a lot of referrals from parents, carers, colleagues sometimes. As long as the person's aware that the referrals yeah. are made, that's absolutely fine. So for the workplace, if you have some concerns about a, a colleague, exactly. it might be possible for you to sort of... And, and is it possible to talk to, a, to, to somebody at the charity and get some advice about how to help somebody seek help as well. Absolutely. Again, pick up the phone. Um, one of our lovely members of the team will kind of have that chat with you. If you're concerned about somebody you're working with and you're not quite sure how to approach it, we've got resources and things that I'm aware of at the end. Yeah. Have a little look. But if you're still not sure and you're still feeling a bit uneasy, just give us a little ring. Great. Thank you very much, Zoe. So I think um, if, we, if I ask you first to just to just sort of get us on the topic. Um, how, I mean, I think I'll pitch in as well here, um, but how do we know, or how do we think um, eating disorders develop? Um, what are the risk factors that, that we may encounter? Um, yeah, just, just for the audience, so can, they can get an idea. So eating disorders, it's not necessarily one trigger point, if you like, that can activate, I guess, in eating yep. disorders. It can be multiple, multiple reasons. Um, trauma, for example, um, a way to cope in the, the world is a very scary place, not, you know, quite a lot, let's face it. There's so much going on. We have no control over anything really that's going on. But for some people, we can control food, we can control what we're eating, we can control our diet. And it mm -hmm. can bring that sense of harm to the anxious world we live in. Um, obviously, social media can, of course, have an yeah. impact. It can start off as children. It can start off as, as adults. It's not particularly an age. But if we do look at children, for example, again, social media has a big impact. Um, came across a statistic that recently said that 80% 80, 80 of 10-year-olds are afraid of being fat. Mm. 80%. Yeah. I'm pretty sure when, when I was 10, um, <laughs> way back, I was too concerned about what tree I wanted to climb, what um, Disney film I wanted to watch, what was going on in the world, not concerned about my body. Mm. 
sadly, something's changed. I don't know what, but something's changed recently to get that statistic high. And yeah. obviously, if that's not dealt with early on, it kind of forced them into adulthood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, so, I mean, you're talking there about this uh, social cultural idealization of, mm -hmm. thin, uh, of thinness, um, you know, and, and, and I think the pressure can come from social media, but regular media as well. And there's this, this pressure, thin ideal, into, you know, so this, this, this image is projected as desirable. And I think, I don't know what you think, but I think um, a lot of the time, uh, because you can modify the way you appear in social media, um, in various ways, you can you can artificially create like a an avatar, a projection of yourself that other people see, and they think that's how that's how people actually look like, you know, celebrities, etc. Right? Um, but but the other thing that I've seen, and I don't know if if you come across this when when you work with people, is that because you are able to create this avatar with these filters, it gives you like an ideal version, not really ideal. But an idealized, um, a harmfully idealized, I'm going to say, uh, version of yourself that you compare your real self with. You, 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 know, you have this image that you've created through filters or whatever it is, and you have your real self to compare. You look in the mirror every day, and and that that disparity, that that um, that kind of clash, I think also may contribute to this internalization. This sort of adopting this this idea that you're not as you should be because there's this image which has your face and it kind of looks like you but it's not you that you should aspire to look like and I think that might be I don't know what you think but I think that might be also and I do think there's some evidence for this that that might contribute to to this uh, internalization of this model that may then lead you down that that particular path I don't know what you think absolutely yes yeah. so obviously let's look at filters for a minute if I may. <laughs> My friends are guilty, but I will scroll through social media and I have to double take sometimes who it is that I'm looking at. I'm like, that doesn't even look like them half the time. Yeah. We're filtering and changing our appearance to make it look like something completely different. Mm. In an ideal world, filters and things wouldn't exist because how mm. wonderful would it be if everyone can just actually be okay with who they are completely? And again, then we wouldn't be scrolling through and seeing such filtered imagery. And again, it would help us realise that genetics exist. Of yeah, course, absolutely. we're all going to look different. Of course, we are. We're genetically designed to be different. And it's not amazing when you think about it. But again, filters, it makes us look like one all the same in a way. Yeah. And it's scary. It yeah, sets and, us and up again, to it makes you, It makes you like, that is, the, that, is, that is normal. That is desirable. That is the right way to look, which is, I think, is, is, is the wrong message. It's what you were saying about that that diversity in in the way we look is actually quite an advantage and is as you say is, is because um is desirable to have these genetic differences uh it's actually quite protective to us as a people right um but but you know this this uh, social media normalization and 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 not and, and just media in general normalization of you know thinness or this thinness ideal make us all sort of uh, aspire to sort of look like that to, to sort of homogenize ourselves to that to that way of looking and that that can be very harmful uh as well you you mentioned um uh trauma but um it, it, you know I, I think i think when we when we talk about trauma it can go obviously from 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 actual uh, history of abuse during childhood and then that that can be a very important risk factor um but also things like that are perhaps you know may may not be as severe as that but also significant like a history of bullying um particularly bullying due to weight or physical appearance i think has also been identified as a clear risk factor um uh, i don't know if you have any experiences of that when talking to people yes um so bullying oh ah, um, lived experience of that to be honest it was definitely a contribution to my not the sole purpose but again a contribution yeah. that one of the factors added, right? yeah. one of the factors absolutely so i was teased horrendously about my weight at school throughout my life um yes not fun and again mm. it made me believe that i was wrong no way it made me believe that my body was wrong because yeah. maybe mm. if i looked like these images maybe if i looked and appeared a certain way i wouldn't be treated like this it's those, I know it's a, it sounds strange saying that out loud, but in that moment when I was on a walk for that eating disorder, I truly believed 
if my body looked like the ideal, I wouldn't be receiving this sort of abuse. Right, right. So, and then it made you change your behavior um, yeah. in order to try and accommodate that, right? So uh, we know self-esteem, low self-esteem is also can be, a, can be a factor. And of course, uh, bullying like the, like the type of th that you were describing that you experienced might contribute to that low self-esteem as well. So you've got a bit of a double whammy going on there. Um, you know, the, having these feelings of inadequacy and helplessness. That, that's some of the things when, when, when I've worked uh, with people with eating disorders and I'm trying to sort of uh, formulate, you know, what happened and how, the, how it started. Uh, one of the things that I screen for is, uh, are these internalized ideas of inadequacy? Like you were saying, you know, I have to look in, the, in a particular way. And also helplessness. Helplessness meaning, meaning that um, I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not even able to achieve it. It's like unattainable. Um, so, so that can also be uh, quite an important risk factor uh, to develop, to develop, uh, to develop uh, something like this. Um, family expectations. I don't know if you come across that. Uh, again, that literally, I, yeah. Literally wrote down family. So I made notes as we're chatting <laughs> just because ADHD. It just so if I'm writing away, I'm not ignoring you guys. I swear. But yes, family expectations is a big one again in the line of work I do and lived experience point of view um cultural as well if you're expected to be a certain size it's hard to live in a body that's deemed wrong I guess mm -hmm. um when you're surrounded by other people counting calories and other people doing quite disordered behaviors of course you're at high risk of doing it mm -hmm. so again lived experience I remember um, my mum weighing herself every single day. That image yeah. is stuck in my head. And I've now got a daughter and it's like, hey, no, absolutely mm -hmm. don't even own scales. Of course I don't. But I, I still have that image of my mum doing that, bless her. And um, I'm going to go off on a side tangent. I do apologise. But recently it's now government policy for the whole calories on the menu thing. Yeah. But actually one in four people that count calories go on to develop an eating disorder. Yeah, there you go. But so if you've got all four, you know, family, everyone's counting calories, statistically, one of them is going to come and see me at some point. Mm. And they're going to need a little bit of help and support. But again, it's so normalized. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, of course, the, the, there's, there's, there's a concern about obesity and that's warranted in terms of mm -hmm. the health impact that obesity can have. That's fair enough. But perhaps some of those approaches might actually be not helpful as, 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 you, as you're pointing out. So when you're thinking about uh, trying to reduce obesity because of the risk factors that obesity can have, like uh, increased risk of diabetes, risk of uh, heart disease, et cetera, et cetera, that's all fair enough, but not at the cost of, of creating an obsession with weight and creating this uh, thinness ideal, which is not healthy either. So, so it's, it's, you know, it's, is, is not necessarily sending the right message uh, there, you know, um, um, absolutely. I mean, I was going to say family history, um, not just pressure from the family, but family history. So um, it seems that if you have uh, if you have a parent like you were uh, describing, or if you have a sibling with anything disorder, you're more likely to have one yourself. So it might be a risk factor. Um, also mental health uh, conditions can increase the risk. Um, so it's more common to have an, um, um, an eating disorder if you have anxiety. Uh, people with obsessive compulsive disorder in particular seem to be a bit more at risk and, and, and people with depression as well. And it might be connected to that low self-esteem and perhaps those early experiences that we were describing. So, so a lot of these factors, as you were saying, is not one size fits all, there's not one factor explains everything, but they are, some of them are, as you can see, interconnected. Uh, and create this, this, um, this, I suppose, this network of vulnerability that that, that you might be um, um, exposed to or, or, or kind of um, influenced by, I suppose. So, so, so yes, I mean, um, uh, certain fields of interest um, can place a higher value on staying uh, slim. Um, I don't know, again, if you've come across any of this, but modeling, dance, athletics, sometimes also put a lot of pressure on people in terms of their weight and the way they should. Because under, you know, um, under a certain way, you, you're able to do something or be in a certain category, get modeling, if, you, if people are interested in that. I don't know if you come across that at all. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So again, just going on service users, kind of experiences, if you like, I have worked 
a lot with young athletes, to be honest. Yeah. Who, of course, they have to watch certain things, have to count macros and do all this this stuff. But at what point does it stop becoming fun for them is always my question. If you're enjoying it and if it's good, then let's do it safely. But are you still able to go out for a meal with your mates? Are you still able yeah. to go and have that night out and have a few too many drinks? If it starts interfering with that because you don't come off your plan, that's when we've got a little bit of an issue. Um, of course, it's okay to do all this sort of thing if, if you're training for a particular thing. But living is also important. You still need to have that life. Again, going out, doing these wonderful things. Hmm. Yeah, and just so, so it doesn't go unmentioned, obviously uh, women are more at risk of developing an eating disorder than men, but men do develop eating disorders as well, just not as frequently. Um, but when you're thinking about risk factors, that, that is, that is um, one where it presents differently. And I think it's probably because the pressure is different. Although I don't know what you see in the people that you work with, uh, I think we're seeing more men, um, you know, more men and boys uh, than we used to. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. You know, that, that's what I that's what I see in the statistics. I don't know what you see. Uh, sorry. Yes, absolutely. I'm so pleased you brought that up because obviously it is Eating Soul Awareness Week this week, and the focus is on boys and men, yeah. which is desperately needed. Um, we have seen a massive rise in referrals to men. Yeah. Um, I think part of it is due to it, there's been a lot of campaigning recently around men's mental health about this whole man up stuff that can get in the bin and sure. toxic masculinity it's mm -hmm. being spoke about so much so much more which again has helped people i think to come forward but still one in four men have never actually spoken to anyone about their eating disorder so there's yeah, a lot of work to do so i think i think I, I, i'm not there. sure if i'm right about this but i think i believe that there's perhaps even more stigma uh, for men coming forward I, I don't know what you think about that we've still got a long a long way to it's improving but we've still got a long way to go stereotypically even in the news this week the focus is on boys and men but I'm still seeing apologies young slim teenage girls that's in the media when actually we should be highlighting the fact that only six percent of people with an eating disorder are underweight six percent yeah. everyone at normal weight obese doesn't matter what size you are Gender, again, we're still seeing a stereotypical. We're not actually seeing that diversity that we need to see. Yeah. Yeah. And again, that might lead to mis misunderstanding eating disorders and, and, exactly. and misperceiving it. So, yes, there's, there's, a, there's a fraction of people with severe eating disorders, anorexia in particular, that, that have these um, extremely thin, um, you know, when, when, you, when you see them, they, they're extreme. I mean, I, I worked in, a, in an inpatient unit for people with eating disorders. And of course, those people um, are at a very severe risk. And, and, and they, they, I mean, I had to do, I was a junior doctor at the time and I was doing daily blood tests because obviously we had to check the, the, the level of the uh, sodium and potassium and all of that on a daily basis because, and, 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 and we were very carefully managing uh, the situation because they were extremely underweight, but that is a vanishingly small percentage of the people that experience eating disorders, isn't it? So, so again, is, is, is the wrong, yes, of course there, there, there is that group and there's the group that is most, most yeah. vulnerable and most, most at risk, you would say, but it doesn't take away from everybody else uh, that no. is also experiencing an eating disorder can, 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 be, can have um, quite a big impact in their lives, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And especially with adults in the workplace, things like that as well, you know, it's exactly. often like, oh, I can't have an eat, that's for young teenage girls, I'm a, you know, middle-aged woman with, no, because I was- Or a middle-aged you know, man. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, I'm too old. I'm too old to have that illness. It's no, it doesn't exist again. That's not me, it? right? Yeah, exactly. That that stereotypical image that we so used to see that doesn't represent me. So I can't possibly have a problem. Mm. I think we're going to put this question up for the audience. Let me see if I if that works. Um, so hopefully everybody's able to see uh, the question. Um, and this is just germane to the topic that we're talking about. So. Not everybody who's extremely thin, ha, you know, is, is, that's, not the old, that's not even a, a surefire way of detecting it, isn't it? So it, it, again, it's, it's just general awareness. How, how would you notice in the workplace, say, uh, that someone has, uh, might have an eating disorder? You know, I'm wondering whether people are able to see this screen. I hope, I hope they are. Are you able to see the screen, Zoe? Yes, yes, I am. Yeah, Very snazzily so, done. I've never seen it like this. 
There you go. So, I mean, if you if you go to the slido.com uh, there and introduce that number there, or use the QR code, you should be able to sort of give your answers uh, as we as we discuss it. But I think it's an interesting topic to raise awareness. And I think, you know, it, it, I, I thought that the audience could get in on this and tell us what they might what they think they might notice, say at work, in particular, in particular at work. Um, so these are not teenage uh, young teenage girls. I mean, they might be. You might have. Yeah, there might be a co-worker that is a young teenage girl. That's absolutely um, a, a, a scenario. But as we were saying, you know, this um, this uh, media image that you, you get portrayed, even in in an awareness week like this week. If you if you, I think Zoe, you are absolutely right. If you look at the news, that's all you get. You get these pictures of of, of young, excessively thin uh, young women. Uh, so there you go. So we've got some answers going on there. Please, you know, please go on and and and, and participate. Um, and um, and 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 we'll just, you know, as as you as you type in your answers, I think we'll comment on on some of those and 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 think on some of those. So calorie counting, um, as you know, I think Zoe was making the point that unfortunately this gets even reinforced, uh, and is is not necessarily all that helpful. And we know this from other research that into obesity actually that calorie counting might perhaps not be the best way to try and help people uh, maintain a healthy weight i don't know zoe do you want to comment again a little bit on uh, oh of course i'll talk i'm blue in the face about calorie counting if i was allowed yeah it is such a normalized behavior but again looking at that statistic one in four will then develop um an eating disorder but it's not just that when we look at calories alone, I'm just going to use a banana, for example. We know that actually they're quite high in calories, but look yeah. at the nutritional value in that banana. It's so Absolutely. it does so many good things for our body. So if we are sorry, if we are purely counting calories, it's not actually that helpful in any way. You need to look more nutritional side of things. What does this food do for our bodies? And also exploring the fact that of course we need all food groups for our bodies to function well of course we need some fats for our hormones to work properly sugars but all of this but it that all kind of gets left out a little bit yeah. and we have this black and i've gone off on a tangent black and white thinking of food that's so normalized it's like oh that's bad food that's good food yeah. again we're missing that everything needs yeah and, and i think i think you get to another potential uh pointer or potential sign that that somebody might be having an eating yeah. disorder which is eating Obsessed. restricting your diet in very specific ways like eliminating all fat and and eliminating uh you know carbohydrates completely uh, for example um might be an indicator that somebody has uh and, and is experiencing an eating disorder uh as well or, or having these very strange modified diets i see i see this in some men as well where they they go for this uh, protein shakes specifically to the exclusion of everything else in their diet, and they they somehow disbelieve that this is very healthy to do, and this will help them build a. So again, they're not underweight, are they? Because they, they're trying to even build muscle, but their eating is quite dysregulated, isn't it? Um, and not, yeah, not. I would, yeah. I mean, I'm a doctor. I've got to say it. Not healthy. <laughs> of course, absolutely. Um, I'm just having another look at some of the. Yeah, yeah. Bob's on here. You guys are doing pretty good, I must admit. Um, yeah, avoidance no, I think, I think it's very good, yeah. I've just picked up one, avoidance of eating in public. It can be like, oh, no, I've had, I had something earlier. I'm, I'm all right. And little yeah, snippets of comments like that. So absolutely. Toilet breaks after food, yeah. Oh, I've just eaten. I've just got to pop to the toilet. I wonder what eating sort of That's that very good be. one, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Picking up food, definitely, yeah. Yeah. yeah, preoccupation. I've just seen one preoccupation with food. You might find that the person, all they can talk about is their latest diet, which is normalised again, sadly. Their latest diet, what diet they're doing, what they've eaten that day, what they haven't eaten that day. It become, it can consume that individual. So if you do notice a colleague kind of, that is all they can seem to talk about, that could be a big, a big red flag that they could be yeah. struggling. Yeah, restricting, absolutely restricting some foods, uh, feeling guilty, yeah, or, oh, you know, yeah. feelings, mm, absolutely, yeah. I shouldn't yeah. have eaten that, oh, I feel guilty because I've eaten that, oh, gosh, I can't, oh, yeah, and, 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 and they can, people can say these things, and you can actually see it, that they, they're they actually feeling quite bad about things, about themselves, uh, having eaten something, um, yeah, and they, they will express these, these, uh, these ideas, right, um, what do we have, um, what else do we have? You know, restrictions, obviously preparing 
food only to give it away to others. <laughs> yes, oh, absolutely. I, yes. I have to laugh. I will go back to when I was at work, when I was severely struggling. The amount of cakes and baking that I would bring into the work environment, I wouldn't have any. No, how dare <laughs> I? But I would literally bake so many cakes for everybody else. Um, yeah, massively. Yeah. That was picked up on quite a lot when I was poorly, actually. Yeah, and over exercising to the point of, you know having you know creating a problem for yourself yeah yeah and, uh... it can be again it can be seen as a good thing again going back to lived experience when i was in the workplace i would go for a little walk on my lunch break i don't want to trigger yeah. anyone so i won't go into specifics but and i was like, oh, well done oh yeah god i wish i had your motivation i was like i'm dying um <laughs> but exactly. it was very normalized like i was pleased just yeah. oh, oh i've got a 15 minutes oh i'm just gonna go get some fresh air and i would do a lap around the car park but again it was just me trying my best to exercise. So again, yeah. little examples that yeah. could be juggling. Mood swings or, or you know, or um, uh, as you say, so, so low mood in general can be part of it. Together, not, not by itself, but together with other things, of course, that you mentioned there in that, in that cloud of um, suggestions. Um, so low, low mood, mood swings with uh, obsessing about food gives you a, cl a clue. Uh, I think we have got problems uh, concentrating. Yes, again, not by itself because that's more non-specific, but in conjunction with other things, can be can be a sign. Um, definitely, cannot eat without running miles first to counteract it. Yeah, so it's something like that, or or, or 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 eating part of the meal, not the whole meal, and and doing very uh, weird things. I I had a I had a um, a gentleman that I was working with that. In order to kind of disguise it, would eat the puddings but not the lunch. Have you? That had, sounds uh, familiar. <laughs> that was me. I used to. Oh, be you did the same. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I used. Yes, I used to do that at work a lot. Like again, um, back in my day, it sounds so wrong, but back in the illness days, I used to work at a nursery, so we would be feeding the children like five times a day. You know, breakfast, snack, dinner, snack, tea. So I was constantly around food, and I would always like pick at bits of the cake, bits of the flapjack, just to be like try and disguise it i guess yeah exactly yeah that, that you know my, my gentleman that i was working with exactly said that you know is to disguise it you know if i'm eating this i, I cannot have anything to show can i because i'm eating oh i food. can't have that look i'm eating this how they you suggest such a thing yeah. 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 yeah yeah i think the audience just, did very well with that um, you did you did amazingly yeah, i'm very impressed um, i just want to pick up on one thing that the mood yeah, swings that someone said yeah, imagine hungry but to the extreme um, that's the only way I can describe it. In, and again, the zoned outness. It's not necessarily the eating behaviours that might pick up on. It is. It might be the moods that you pick up on, the, the low energy, the not quite, and not quite as on it with the yeah, work. The most. concentration, definitely. Concentration. Yeah. Um, meetings. I would be sat in a meeting and I had no idea what was going on half the yeah, time right. because my brain was on food, exercise, but I couldn't focus. Yeah. So it could just be or, that. Or ruminating on the guilt because you just had food. Oh yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. So I might have been in the room, but I wasn't actually in the room. So again, it could be that side Absolutely. of the No, but I mean, it, it, it's. Uh, I think. I think. I think we can be satisfied that people, you know, in the audience have a good idea about how to potentially spot that something like this is going on. That's very good. Um, so I think I have another question for the audience and for you. Huh. This one is because, um, so I, you know. I, I, in the audience, we may have some people that have experienced an eating disorder themselves or are experiencing an eating disorder themselves. And I thought this is this might be a good question to ask the audience. Uh, let's imagine, even if you haven't, if you don't have an eating disorder, you're concerned about somebody, just imagine yourself having an eating disorder, uh, the guilt, the shame, the stigma, all of that surrounding it. How would you, how would you like to be approached uh, yourself? Because that might give you a hint as to how to approach others uh, as well. Uh, but if you have, if you, um, if you've got some experience yourself, it might be good to. Again, you don't need to reveal it, but it might be good to put in there. What are the things that you would have found helpful? Um, and of course, Zoe, I'm going to ask you. Uh, what are the ways in which you would have felt helpful for people to approach you when you were in that situation that you were describing? Uh, you know, just just a minute ago. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to steal that first one. It's just kind of popped up, and that's quietly the last thing. Oh my goodness, um, the last thing I would want was to be confronted in like a room of everybody. 
which again is what my boss did originally, bless her, she didn't know any better, but hey ho. Um, yeah, I was working with the children, there was like four or five other staff members about, and she was like, oh, I think I didn't talk to you about your eating, you know, I think you've got it, and it was just so, what? Like, I was trying to concentrate on the kids, so was, there was running riot at this point, <laughs> staff were all looking over, and it, I can't describe how horrendous that felt. So, yes, quietly, non-judgmental, and with somebody that actually you really trust is my absolute go-to. Don't just do it in a room for the people. Take them to a safe space. And someone else is to support as well, just asking twice, well, are you okay? You don't have to even talk about the food. Yeah. I think that's important. You don't even need to talk about food. No, just ask how they are. Say, you know, I've noticed, going back to the other slides, I've noticed you're not quite with it. You're feeling a bit, your moods are dropping a little bit. Um, I'm noticing you're getting a little bit anxious about food. I just want to check in. How are you doing? How are you? Are you okay? Seriously, mate, are you okay? No. Also, yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's helpful to sort of say the things that you've noticed in a, in a kind and compassionate way. For example, I noticed that in meetings you struggle. Do you need anything? Do you need any support with that? Any help? Uh, you know, is there anything I can do? Um, I noticed that you con- you know, that sometimes you struggle concentrating. So the things that you've noticed, I think, are reasonable to mention uh, in that way. Not necessarily about the eating, but some of the other things that that we were talking about. Um, yeah. I noticed that sometimes, you know, whatever it is that you can say genuinely and sympathetically, I think would be would be helpful. Um, con- with concern, building a good relationship, non-judgmentally, I think that's that's um, that's important. If you have a good relationship with them, if you're worried um, and and you and you don't necessarily have a good rapport, you might be about approaching somebody that does uh, and seeing if if they feel able to do it. Um, you don't feel that you have the the you know the, the rapport with this person. Um, any other pointers that we can give uh, to people? I would uh, say time is a big big one you know if you're about to approach this subject with somebody they may there's going to be emotion (laughs) make sure that they've got time out of the day to kind of unpack that if they need to and they don't have to then rush off back to work and try and because that's yeah that's a lot to deal with um so just give them a little bit of a break afterwards if they need to you know say look go and have a coffee or go and have a drink or don't rush back after having that conversation. Just have some time to deconfess. Yeah. And also, you know, they say start a, a casual conversation in a casual environment. That's fair enough. But you also need to be prepared that it might take a while. So it's better that you, if you decided that it's worth approaching somebody, to have that break in your own diary so that you don't have to rush off. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Listening to that as well. Can, can, it can be a bit a bit heavy for exactly them as well of course it can yeah you were talking about just before uh we started the the webinar that you you've been working this morning with some people and of course you need time between sessions as well yeah i don't know if you want to sort of say a little bit about that you can't see because it's massive but obviously i do work one-to-one with children young people with eating disorders look when you've got like a five-year-old bulimic opposite you it is it's hard of course it's going to be hard so I like in between sessions compassion fatigue exists so I'll sit and do some painting and I've got a massive canvas on the go at the minute I'll just take five or ten minutes just to calm down before you know carrying on with my day because it it can be really heavy sometimes so it's important for the employee and the employer to kind of look after yourselves as well yeah and and give give you that time to have that break if you need yeah Uh, absolutely yeah um, also, I mean, I think the one thing is, as a manager or as a colleague, you don't have to have all the answers at all. Uh, I think all you need to do, and you know, you don't necessarily need to even try to solve the problem. I don't think that you, what you need to do is to is to try and listen. I think we've got the um, uh, you know, compassionate listening is, is is one thing that I I can't see it now, but it was there on the on the on the work cloud. Um, yeah. But but just sort of. Even when you, so there's there's a temptation, even if you've experienced this problem yourself, that you might have some things that have worked for you and to try and jump in with solutions. And I don't think that that's necessarily the best approach. It's more about listening and seeing where they are. Also, you may have suspected that there's an eating disorder, but maybe there isn't. Maybe it is depression, maybe it is anxiety, maybe it is something else. 
So again, is, is to have that open mind and letting the person uh, just express themselves and, and not jumping with, with solutions, just about clarifying and listening and, and being, you know, lending that compassionate uh, ear to, to what they're going through is enough. And is then, is then, it's not for you to diagnose anything um, and it's not useful. It's more for you to uh, signpost, you know, who might, who might then, so we've got here nutritionist, psychologist, uh, on the on the workload, which I think means it might it might be good to talk to them about you know seeking help, and I think that makes sense. Uh, and it's about you more or less being aware of what's available at work, where you can signpost people to. There might be an EAP, there might be a service like Thrive, where we have uh, uh, therapists that you can uh, point people towards. You know, download the app and get in touch with a the therapist, uh, and they might they might get you on your journey. Um, and 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 is that sort of thing is about simply helping them and sometimes it's about um you know supporting them because there might be a barrier they might be experiencing this barrier do i do i step forward do i not how do i do it and it might be about okay um here's some information but maybe you want to do it you know maybe you want to do it with them or help them in some way to achieve uh you know contact with with whatever professional you're recommending i don't know if you if there's anything that you can say for example when somebody is thinking about uh trying to get somebody to speak to first steps you know what what is the best way to go about it, Zoe. It sounds cheesy, but to give me a little bit of space as well. You know, again, it's it's quite a heavy going conversation. But the fact that you've made yourself known as like a safe person, so to speak, means okay, you might pass them some information. You know, just go and have a little look at this. Just let me know if you want to chat about it. But I'm just going to sign with I'm just going to give you these. You know, go in prepared if you like. I'm going to give you these little bits of information, these leaflets, these resources. Have a little look in your own time. You don't have to answer now, but if you want the support, let's have a chat about it. I'm here and I might not understand myself, but I can listen. Yeah. Actually, being transparent is very important. You say, I might not understand myself and I might say the wrong thing. You can even say that. I might say the wrong thing. No. I don't mean it. It's just that I don't know enough. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's absolutely fine if you, if you say this to somebody. They will they will be very understanding when you pretend to know is when it's difficult or when you or when you seem to sort of oh the solution is this that's that when it might i don't know what you think Zoe, but that's when it might go wrong yeah because again if you imagine an individual of an eating disorder they may be already experiencing guilt shame low self-esteem and now you yeah. yourself on this pedestal and go, oh i'm better than you because just do this and your problems will be solved yes. again it's just adding more oh why can't i do this it exactly yeah. adds that low self-esteem and that's what that solution which is with done with the best intentions that that you know presenting you with a solution you know if you only did this it would be all better if that's only. where you can backfire yeah that's where you can backfire yeah uh, and it, again it's done with the best of intention you know it's always done with the best of intention but it has that, that potential pitfall right um okay um that's very good. I think. I think again, the audience uh, building a good relationship. I think. Uh, I think we had some very good answers there uh, from the audience. So let's uh, let's let me ask you something else. Um, what wh when you were approached? If, if you don't mind, we can we can talk a little bit about your experience to just give a pe people like a bit of a a, a vignette. Yeah. So uh, what made it difficult? for you to take the first step, for example, if you don't mind me asking? The main boy for me was, I would have to have time away from work. Right. I had a mortgage, um, a car, you know, bills to pay. Right. Um, I was very aware that if I was as poor as what everyone was saying, then surely I would have to have time away and I, I can't afford to do that. Right. right. So what would have been really, really useful would have been a bit of a chat about what well, okay if you need time off then that's fine and exploring options as financial options because again that's just added stress and it can be a big barrier mm -hmm. yeah no that makes a lot of sense so and, and uh, so with options like taking time off but also maybe a part-time because you might have need time for appointments or just talk about that that particular scenario where you need regular time for appointments uh to be building your diary uh which i think is very important i mean we experience this in eating disorders but also in other presentations where sometimes employers so you know we have people coming to us and preferring uh evening times when we feel quite strongly that you know that it should it, they should have the facility to you know when you go to the dentist you, you think nothing of saying i'm going to the dentist you know why should this be any different you know you, you have an appointment you have an appointment 
Yeah, so having time off for those appointments, again, making it known that that's okay and that's an option would have really taken that. Yeah, so that psychological off. safety about yeah. that was available. Yeah. Knowing that my job's still safe, um, mm. that would have been really, really helpful as well. There was a point where I wasn't particularly safe to work, I will be honest. And mm. at this point, again, I was very severe at this point. My manager literally had to ring like 999 when I was sat in the office sobbing my heart out because she just didn't know what to do with me. And I didn't know what to do with myself at this point. But in fact, she went, right, just come. She got me covered. She moved me from the situation. She just let me cry and went, right, this is what we're just going to do because you just need help and worry that you're going to pass out again. Right. So I out in a room and whatnot. And she was like, you're not in any trouble because I thought I was going to get fired because rational thinking goes out the window when you're extremely malnourished. Yes. Um, so again, I was just reassured, look, you're not going to get fired. You're not going to get in trouble. We just want to make sure that you're safe. We just need to check in over. So at that but again, that I needed that reassurance. Yeah. Again, my job's safe. I'm not going to get fired. I'm not in any trouble. Calm down. So, it, I mean, you mentioned how they did it. And we mentioned a little bit about how it might have been better. Is there anything else that you can say about what would have made it easier for you uh, in terms of, you know, having that, ex you know, that experience? So it would have been instead of like obviously the the, the thing that you, I, I seem to sort of hear from from your description of the experience that I think your boss probably had the best intentions again. She did. But yeah, but um, maybe you didn't feel very safe. And what else could it could it she have done as a manager? Uh, do you think is there anything else that we can suggest? Yeah. So one of the things, bless her heart. Um eventually she did do was she actually took time and it sounds so simple but it'd be surprised me affecting this just spend 10 15 minutes googling eating sodas in a different because go. again she had a very stereotypical image in her head that yeah. was just but she how can girls, but, yeah. what and again because I was living in a larger body I had atypical anorexia so yeah. I looked a healthy weight whatever a healthy weight even is so again she, she couldn't see she struggled to see it. So she mm. just went on a few websites, Google, and she was like, oh, Osfed, oh, eight. oh, these exist. Yeah. And then okay. she, again, she still didn't understand, but at least she, she kind of understood a little bit more. Um, yeah. And there was, there's helplines and things that she could pass to me when I was having panic attacks in the office. <laughs> she right. found a helpline I could ring through Beat, and she was like, just speak to them, just, again, take time out, just go do what you need to do. I don't understand, but these people do. Here you go. And again, just allowing me that time throughout the day to manage those emotions. And yeah. also, one of the best things that she did do, actually, was I had to have quite a long period of time off work. Mm -hmm. I, I did have to enter a setting, and I was there five days out of seven in the end. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But again, we had check-in days, so because I, I felt so out of it with work because um, all of a sudden I wasn't there but I felt oh, it's my job it's my livelihood it's my identity in a way or part of it yeah so we did check-in days um again wouldn't necessarily talk about treatment stuff like how are you how you doing just general but just checking in with me how's it going um allowing me to have that time it didn't rush me back she did not rush me back if I'd gone back a few months sooner, I'd have had to have another long period of time off. That's important to know. Yes, what yeah. was needed? And that what that pressure just... might be might be counterproductive, wouldn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So um, there was a stage where I did return back too soon. We realised it was too soon. I crumbled and I had more time off. So we both realised, no, just 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 go do what you need to do and come back when I was ready. Yeah. And then, Chats with the psychologist, chat with the treatment team. They then decided, actually, let's do a staggered return. Staggered return to work was the best thing I could have done because, again, it reintroduced me to the workplace slowly. Mm -hmm. So that's, again, another another top tip for managers yeah. to sort of think about these staggered returns. That can be very helpful. It's little, so I've got a tangent again. It's little things as well, like um, she also allowed me ex like little mini, because obviously I was on the meal plan, six meals a day. Yes. Like consistent, so she allowed me like five, ten minutes here and there just to go and make sure that I was having my snacks in a yep. quiet room, make sure that I was sticking to my meal plan, um, making sure I had proper, proper, proper regular 
breaks just to mm. ensure that I was staying focused on recovery. Yeah, that, you know, absolutely. So, so there are some very good examples of what not to do from your manager and some very good examples of what to do. So both things. <laughs> so again, you can you can get it wrong with the best of intentions, unfortunately. But but yeah, so those simple things, it's not that difficult, isn't it? But uh, those simple things can, can help a lot. Great. Uh, after the conversation, what what is it that one should do? You know, again, we're not experts. We're not going to diagnose anything. Um, I mean, I tend to sort of see it in three categories. I'm I'm a little bit worried, but not too worried. You know, uh, so I am actually worried, or I'm very worried. You see what I mean? Like green, amber, red kind of thing. Uh, just to make it very simple. So. You walk away from that conversation, you're not too worried, but you do want to do something. What do you do? Sorry. That's where um, if a little bit of not too worried, a lot of self-help resources can come in really helpful then. Yeah. Um, I am just going to tweet First Steps website here. On there, there's there like <laughs> a mass, I couldn't help it, sorry. No, no, no like, I mean, you should. In fact, I'm just going to put it up now. Yeah, um, there's talk. like a massive resource on First Steps on body image, stuff like that. Beats have got some fabulous resources. Five, obviously, workplace things like that. Just you know, just have a little look at some of the resources and self help bits and bobs. What's what's out there? I wonder. Um, so self help resources can be really really helpful at that point. With the amber, a little bit of, from here. This is where your massive. Oh, thank you. Signposting <laughs> come into it. So actually, you know, I would like to kind of need some treatment here. Um, you know, there's some fabulous blogs and things that you can give to them. Say look. I think you really need some help again signposting them to services signposting them to counseling proper support um red this is where <laughs> this is where again the ambulance jobby came into it and i was escorted out of work because i was not safe at the time i did not like that i was angry and i was frustrated and i was hurt but looking mm. back it was the right thing to do mm. i wasn't safe to be around those children i was alive I, yeah i wasn't safe so it was a case of, look, you are not coming back until you've got help, <laughs> which sounds so harsh, but she, she words it a bit nicer than that. But that's how I took it. She said, well, right, you have a week off um, this week. It was, I'll be honest, it wasn't a paid week. She was like, you've got this paid week off. It Under the condition, you go to the GP. Yeah. You go and get sorted and you have some time to think about, you know, where, where you're going to end up if you're not careful. Mm. And she literally forced me to have that week got away from work and that was when I went to GP and I was very I eventually got under the adult eating disorder team it did take time yeah but, because it's, it, there's some barriers there that you have to sort of negotiate isn't it and it's not easy but yeah so eventually you find your way there so I think that gives a, a good picture of, of things yeah. so self-management self first if it's not too worried but I want to do something if you're worried, I think uh, getting getting them to be in charge still, but actually, me. yeah, I, I I I like at that stage to extract some commitments from people. So, you know, would you would you would you um, would you agree to sort of see the GP, and when do you plan to see the GP by? And then just gently check with them. Did you actually go and see the GP? Did you need any help with that? Do you need some time off? Yes, that, again, you know, that sort of allowing that time. I know I keep banging on about that, but it is one of the most useful things. Again, just, yeah, just takes that pressure off. If you weren't able to see the GP, like like we discussed, why don't you take some time off so you're able to see the GP? That sort of thing. That's that's a number, you know, middle. I'm, I'm worried and I want them to sort of actually seek help. And the red one is I may need to call an ambulance here because they, they are at risk or, you know, and, and, and it has to be done. And that's okay. As you say, it might feel very harsh in the moment, but yeah, the right looking thing to back, do. Looking back, yeah. it was the right thing to do. I again, I screamed and I cried. I wasn't very happy bunny at the time, but again, they had to put they, they put my health first, and I can see that now, which yeah. is the main thing. And, and that was the right thing to do, even though it felt yeah, a bit difficult. How harsh, but actually, yeah, I needed looking at. Okay, um, I think um, I think we'll just go into a bit of a Q&A um, now, if, if people in the audience have some questions. I think we have a Q&A function, um, uh, or the chat function. Uh, will this information will be, will be sent to us? I think we're recording the, the, the webinar and we'll make it available to all participants. Um, you know, so all the information and the, and the, uh, 
the slide that I had even first, perhaps I'll go back to it as well, so people can take good note of it if they need it. Hold on. Uh, let's go back to that um, as we as we do the questions. Uh, so yeah, so the, the recording will be available, and we can do that. Um, but if you want to post some questions on the chat or or the Q and A, uh, that would be great. Um, let me see if I can see some questions. The Q and A will be easier actually for me. Yeah. Is there anything more general uh, for the workplace to consider rather than reacting to concerns over a specific individual? Yes, well, I'm so pleased you asked that. Sorry, I was going to yes. jump right in. Yes, um, some of the things that workplaces do, again, it's not necessarily meant in that way, but it can be a massive trick. If someone may be on the edge of developing eating disorder or someone in the midst of it, or, yeah, things like, I always won the Workplace Weight Loss Challenge in Christmas. Every year we had this sort of thing. And people couldn't understand why I was so good at it. Because I was I'm eating solid, of course I was good at it. Um, things like chocolate around the staff room, again, just modifying that language. Oh, you shouldn't eat these because these are bad, but actually saying things like, oh, I fancy one of these. I'm going to enjoy it because one chocolate ain't going to kill me. Um, encouraging that sort of language within the workplace. Sorry, I went off on a tangent. I do apologise. I'm just rereading the question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just watching those sort of things. Um, yeah. A lot of places as well do they even give money now for like losing weight. And again, it's not necessarily helpful in some ways. Um, again, I, I'm aware of the obesity thing, but just just watching. Yeah, but I mean, again, it doesn't necessarily address. And, and again, it, it, it ends up being the wrong it ends up sending the wrong message, and, and again, yeah. yeah. So, so the people with the eating disorders yeah. will always win. They, they, <laughs> they you know, uh, will will eat those. Uh, will will sort of have win those challenges, and it's, it's not healthy. So <laughs> that's a problem. Um, uh, I think it, it generically for the workplace is is more about uh, you know sessions like this can be very helpful. So to drive that awareness, what is what is else is helpful in the, in the workplace? Creating that sense of psychological safety in general. So this is good for eating disorders, but other things as well. Just being able to sort of speak freely, uh, you know, telling people what Zoe was saying at the beginning, you know, that if you do have any of these concerns, we're flexible. You know, th there are these things that we can do. We can do these reasonable adjustments and just try to sort of um, speak about this um, publicly as a management team, but also uh, through, you know, discussions like this and talks like this, uh, th that, that can be very helpful. So it's, enabling people to feel safe when they seek help. So Zoe was thinking, I'm going to get fired. Um, and, and, and actually, her manager didn't have that attitude at all, but she didn't know, did she? So the workplace didn't tell her this, that she was safe to speak up and, and safe, to, you know, safe to seek some support. That's what have been very helpful. And that's a generic thing that we can do for all things. You know, just drive that message so that people are, feel confident, psychologically safe to come up and discuss these things. And, and then be signposted. That makes sense. I think that's the most helpful thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me see what we have here. Um, yeah, so the yeah, so we'll make the 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 slides. But to all the participants, I think we're sending them uh, after. So Emily, uh, who's organised it, will send them through. Uh, we'll send them to all participants. Uh, we'll send them to to your email. I think the email that you registered with. I'm just typing that up so so people can see that. Um, so um, how can an adult, how can a young adult be supported with anorexia if they're not receiving the support that they feel they're benefiting them? So that, um, I don't know, Zoe, do you have any ideas about how? Yeah, I was just reading. And, yeah. I was just reading that one. Um, it's hard without knowing kind of what. Exactly, the specifics. Yeah, yeah um, if it's right for you, if you want to kind of email me directly with that one, we can have a little bit of a chat and I can do some signposting if that's okay. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Uh, you know, we, we, we're not able to sort of answer specific questions, but in general terms, it, it might be it might be that if the, if the, there might be two barriers there. One is that they're not, they haven't formed a good therapeutic alliance for whatever reason. Yeah, you felt, that, you've got to okay. get... You've got to get on with your therapist, I'll be honest. Um, exactly, yeah, and that's if, okay. That, yeah, that, and fine. a good therapist will recognize this and, and help the person move on to it. And another therapist and it's nobody's fault. Um, uh, it might be that there's some resistance that because this is hard work, 
so I will tell you how hard this work is and and sometimes you avoid and and it might be about the approach so that's why answering generically might not be helpful and and perhaps you know if you email Zoe perhaps you might have a she might have a good good answer for Sorry about that I did want to go into depths of things no, I, think, I think it makes sense yeah yeah bless you um uh, currently due to caring responsibilities, I've been sleep deprived for a few years now. That's difficult. I noticed that has, has that, I noticed how that has impacted negatively how I manage control my food intake. Absolutely, and, and, and sleep is, is very important. Um, there's various things that if you interfere with sleep will make it very difficult for you to sort of manage a, a healthy a healthy diet in general, healthy eating in general, uh, which becomes sedentary has a result in me putting on weight. I've come to test with the fact that increasing the quantity and quality of sleep is off the table in the near future. However, how can I improve my eating habits in spite of sleep deprivation? I don't know that it's off the table. I think I think there might it might be worth some exploring uh, whether whether the, something can be done about in, improving your sleep. But taking that for granted, um, Zoe, do you have any ideas about about this? It's again, I would be kind of inclined to agree with you a little bit there what's going on with that sleep I wonder if yes. there is ways we can actually manage that sleep a little bit more even even in difficult circumstances when sleep is interrupted yeah. there are things that can be done yeah absolutely um other than that just I know it sounds cheesy but making sure that we're actually eating enough um quite often if we're sleep deprived we convenience things like that but if we kind of it sounds bad but going back to meal planning almost and making sure that we're getting nutritional value out of our food and I always recommend the, the standard six meals a day you know breakfast having a little snack making sure our metabolisms are working properly um making sure we're not going long periods of time without food as well that can have an impact but I would be curious to explore that sleep a little bit further I know that's not very helpful sorry and I'm helpful, but, yeah. but <laughs> I, I would say that I would say that sometimes you assume that that nothing can be done, but maybe maybe something could be done. And sleep deprivation is a, is a big health problem in general, and it, it's worth on its own if you're not getting very good quality of sleep. And this is disrupting things. To have a consultation specifically about that with your GP, some GPs will be more aware than others, and and it might be about being a bit perseverant, and and you know, uh, going for one that actually does uh, do something about sleep. Sleep is one of the pillars of health. And it's you know it, it, something may be possible to be done even in that difficult circumstance. Is the therapy provided by first steps specific to eating disorders only, and focus on recovery, or does it address the background and reasons why? For yeah. example, we talked about bullying, we talked about uh, trauma, we talked about other uh, risk factors. Of course, um, if you don't, you just stick in a plaster on it, really. Aren't you? <laughs> Let's face it; it could come out. I know it sounds a bit harsh, but it could come out in other kind of maladaptive coping strategies so with our we do have a private counseling service and um, it's like slidey scale so it's it ranges in price depending benefits stuff like that um but yeah we absolutely do go and address address the issues about again purely eating disorder but we're still we're still managing and dealing with all of this other stuff let's go back and unpick all of those things as well yeah which i don't think you can do with it in isolation can you really yeah it was our counselors are very very equipped with, shall we say? Yeah, I mean that's that's the whole point. I, I will also say, I mean, we, we don't have a specialist service in, in, in Thrive, but if your employer has it available, um, we do have uh, therapy as as part of what we do, and and yes, again, we would be able to address mild to moderate uh, eating disorder conditions alongside other things uh, if you have access to it to, uh, by working. Obviously, in, in our case, it's paid for by your employer, so it's free to you. And we don't put a cap on, on the number of sessions that you require. It's more uh, driven by outcomes that you want to achieve uh, rather than anything else. So that might be interesting to sort of for you to, to, to hear. And, and I just put that up there in case people are not aware. Uh, and maybe they have, they have um, access to it um, uh, through work. So um, thank you very much, Zoe. I think, I think, um, I think that was it. Uh, I think that was the last question. Uh, thank you all very much uh, for staying with us until the very end. And for your participation, I think it was great. Um, thank you very much for the, you know, um, putting your answers on the slides. I think that was very good, and and uh, I think you were an excellent audience, very well informed in general. Yeah, that you was are. Great good job, <laughs> so so yeah, I don't know, Zoe. Do you have any any parting words? 
uh, just one last week. Will it be confidential from your employer if you actually? It will be. Know? Yeah, it's nothing to do with. I mean, they pay for it, and that's it. To be honest. And we report on numbers, but we don't don't report on individuals. So we say X many people access this, X many people recovered, but we don't say any, we don't give any details. It's all anonymous. Absolutely. Yeah. And the information is yours, not your employers. And the, the health record that we create for you is yours, not your employers. Fabulous. Yeah, just something closing though, I guess. If you know, if you want to learn a little bit more about eating disorders, obviously we do have our CPD courses or just spend a bit of time on, as well as First Steps, Beat, Beat's yep. website as well. They've Very got good. a list of all the like, eating disorders and the subcategories and a little bit of background information just to have a little bit of research on. I'd recommend just having five minutes just going over it because you never know. Um, and yeah, if you did need anything, obviously you've got my email address anyway, but just, just pop me any messages, any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you all very much. As I said, the, the recording will be uh, made available to all that, that joined us today and feel free to sort of share it with uh, colleagues as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Zoe. Thank you.